Today, I'm going to give the last lecture in a series on the different routes of transmission. Uh, and this is transmission via touch. And the reason why I wanted to concentrate on the routes of transmission is once you know the route of transmission, uh, you have a much better idea how you can uh, intervene to prevent a disease uh, and you have a better understanding of what it's going to do. And there are, uh, there are broadly five different routes of transmission. Uh, the vector-borne with insects and arachnids, oral, mainly by food and water, sexual and blood-borne, respiratory, and the last one I'm doing tonight, uh, which is touch. Usually, one route is dominant, uh, meaning that a particular infection does almost all of its transmission primarily by one of these routes, but sometimes they have a secondary route as well, and we'll come on to that uh, with this uh, with touch. Now, getting an infection via touch uh, seems an obvious way to pass on infections, but actually it's a lot harder than you might think, and many infections are not passed on by touch or only to a small degree. The principal reason for this uh, is that the skin is both tough and very well defended. If, things, if uh, um, bacteria, viruses, or others get onto the skin, uh, unless they are highly specialized, they are much le they're fairly unlikely to get through the skin. And when they do, they meet a very effective immune response. But there are also cultural and social reasons why uh, we are defended against touch diseases. There are actually very strong cultural norms not to touch strangers. Uh, and then clothes uh, add a further layer of defense. So if you bump into someone, both of you are wearing clothes, that again reduces the risk of transmission. Uh, and uh, in the modern era, for, for frequent bathing and washing and ironing of clothes uh, add additional ways in which the risk of transmission is reduced. So there are social reasons which help protect us as well as uh, the um, biological ones. But to go back to the skin itself, it has very good immunological defences with a relatively small number of things that sort of poke through those, such as hair and uh, sweat follicles. Different sorts of skin have different levels of protection, so the very tough skin you have on the soles of your feet and the palms of your hands uh, have a diff slightly different set of risks uh, to the skin you have uh, in other parts of the body. This social aspect, though, to touch is important when thinking about both how diseases are transmitted and when there are epidemics, for example, how you can go about reducing the risk of transmission. When is it normal for any of us uh, to touch a non-family member? Well, it's an important part of affection and closeness and trust. So that means people tend to touch people within their close social group certainly within their families. But this is very strongly bounded. And actually, most people do not touch strangers uh, if they can possibly avoid it. And you'll see this if you go into a lift, for example, people moving apart from one another. Uh, and in fact, at the extremes, uh, it is actually legal to touch someone uh, intentionally uh, who does not want it. But there are situations where touch is normal. Uh, children touch one another the whole time, and that's important. You'll see many of the touch diseases are particularly common among children. There are social in interactions which it is completely normal to touch someone. Shaking hands, for example, uh, sp phys many physical sports, it's completely normal to touch someone. And then, and importantly, uh, healthcare and social care are settings where touching people is absolutely essential, uh, both physically to help people move, for example, uh, and to provide reassurance. So this is, uh, there are situations where touch is normal, but in most situations, in fact, touching strangers uh, is not. Now, there are several ways that an infection can be passed on principally by touch. They include skin-to-skin -skin infections, and I'll go through each of these groups, like viral warts or scabies, several bacterial skin infections, hospital-inquired infections, and this goes back to the fact that hospital is a place where touching people is an essential part uh, of treating them, 
Then you have uh, many diseases where someone might touch a person or excretions from a person and then touch their mucous membranes, particularly their mouth or eyes. Uh, and these, uh, in some cases, can be quite severe diseases like Ebola or Lassa fever. Then there are some diseases which you catch things by touching soil, sand, or water. And several parasites, fungi and bacteria, uh, do this either as a part of their life cycle, they've designed uh, in this way of being transmitted, uh, or in a sense, incidentally. And finally, there are some diseases which are uh, passed on by puncturing the skin by some mechanism, and I'll come on to the in the end, uh, at, and these include very severe diseases, such as rabies or tetanus. But all of these require you physically to touch someone or to touch an object uh, which is infected in some way. So this is quite different, for example, from the respiratory infections I was talking about in the last lecture, where you actually can uh, infect someone at a moderate distance, or the vector-borne infections, where you can actually infect people at really quite some distance away. Now, the fact that something's uh, transmitted by touch does not necessarily mean that that's that the skin is where the disease will be most uh, important, although in some cases it will be. Infections transmitted by touch can affect every organ of the body. Some of the infections are skin diseases, but many actually affect other organs, such as the gut or the nerves, and these include some of the most feared multisystem diseases of humans at all. And on the other hand, there are many infections which manifest in the skin, but in fact are transmitted by different routes. So, for example, syphilis, transmitted by the sexual route, or leprosy, transmitted by the respiratory route, uh, manifests through the skin. So you can actually see that there isn't a straight correlation between which organ transmits and which organ is primarily affected. Now, I'm going to start off with the more straightforward, in a sense, skin-to-skin -skin infections, many of which uh, are relatively mild, uh, but uh, they are common uh, and they can be uh, distressing. Several viruses specialize in transmission by touch, and these include warts of the hands and feet, and feet often called verrucas, uh, and these tend to be passed on by direct contact between two people or via an object, particularly wet objects like walking uh, in a swimming, swimming pool which hasn't got proper uh, protections uh, uh, and when they're wet. Uh, these are not usually dangerous, uh, but they're sometimes unsightly and particularly on the feet can be uncomfortable. And there are treatments to be given for them, uh, but um, they are very common. And then there are a variety of other viruses. I've just chosen uh, a, one called Molluscum contagiosum on the, bet at the bottom of these slides, uh, which are rarer but also are viral passed on by touch, often in childhood, because remembering this is a time of uh, people's lives and they do tend to touch a lot more people who uh, are their own age um, uh, and uh, do that as part of their normal play and behavior. Then there are parasites which are passed on person to person by touch, and these are highly, again, highly specialized uh, parasites to be transmitted by this route. Probably the one that most people, uh, the two, this about the two that most people have come across most are scabies. Now, scabies is a mite. It's very small. You can't see it on the top right. Uh, there's a photomicrograph of it, significantly magnified. And it burrows in, into the skin and then moves around in the skin. It can be very itchy, uh, particularly with a heavy infestation. Now, you don't get this just by a passing, uh, brushing against someone in the tube. Uh, or a quick handshake. You usually get this by prolonged contact. So it tends to be in very enclosed environments and uh, within, uh, within families. Usually not serious in the UK, uh, but it does need to be treated. And people who have very severe infections, as well as being distressing, can in some cases get uh, bacterial infection on top, and this can cause significant problems. And then a different sort of a uh, parasite, which is passed on by touch, are nits, head lice. Uh, anybody who's been at school will have had friends and uh, who've had nits, many people in fact will have had them themselves, extremely common, uh, and they are passed on where people bring their heads close together. They can be passed on by other things, but that's the majority of the situations. Uh, again, relatively easy to treat, 
once they're in a family, because families tend to huddle together, uh, they tend to get passed around uh, extremely straightforwardly. So that's viruses and parasites. There are then some fungi, which are again passed on person to person. Uh, at the one that is probably the most striking of these is ringworm, uh, shown rather typically on the top left and uh, a, a different form uh, in the hair uh, of someone on the right. And this comes from contact, again, between two people touching one another or through things like infected towels. Sharing towels with strangers, as uh, will come on to several other infections, uh, is generally uh, not a sensible idea if they haven't been washed in between whiles. And then another very common thing, athlete's foot. This is very commonly caught, particularly walking barefoot in showers uh, or in changing rooms. Uh, and athlete's foot uh, is, for most people, relatively trivial, again, unsightly, but potentially a route by which other infections can get into the body because it breaks the skin down. So it, they are, again, they do need treat, treating. Uh, these kinds of fungal infections can usually be treated relatively straightforwardly using creams or other treatments which you can buy straight from a pharmacist, although in severe cases, uh, some people may need antifungal drugs from a GP, but treatments are available. Bacteria also have infections which are typically passed on and a bit specialised to be passed on person to person by touch. And a good example of this uh, is something, again, which is really relatively common in childhood. Most people will know someone who's had it, may well have had it themselves, uh, in patigo. This causes a crusting kind of infection uh, and, and it's, called, it's passed on by people touching one another there are two bacteria which typically cause it, uh, Streptococcus pyogenes, uh, and something I'll come back to because it comes up repeatedly in the touch diseases, uh, an infection called Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, it's most common in younger children, again, uh, largely because of the fact that children tend to touch one another more. Uh, and the key ways to reduce the risk of this, particularly if someone's got it, is obsessive hand washing when they have it, uh, not sharing things like towels uh, and avoiding contact uh, where it's not necessary until it's gone away. Once, uh, it, it's, it's relatively easy to treat, and once it's gone away, uh, the risk is substantially reduced. So these are all relatively um, straightforward infections uh, to treat, but all relatively common. Now, many times, bacteria are transmitted between two people, and then they just sit there on the skin, perfectly happily colonizing the skin. All of our skins are covered uh, in a variety of infections, but doing no harm. And then from time to time, for, for a variety of reasons, but usually because there's been a break in the skin, for example, with a wound, a scratch, or athlete's foot was an example of that, and particularly in people who've got uh, pre-existing conditions like diabetes, it can then get through the skin into the layers uh, in the skin or just below the skin, and people can get infections. And a classic example of this uh, is cellulitis. Uh, the person in this um, photograph has cellulitis in one of the legs. It's obvious, it's obvious which one. Uh, and um, this is a, an unpleasant infection. It can be quite a severe infection until it's treated with antibiotics. So this is something which definitely does need treating. So this is not on the skin. This has now got under the skin. Uh, and will make this person, if it's untreated, feel extremely unwell and indeed was very dangerous in a pre-antibiotic era. People will often need uh, relatively prolonged antibiotic treatments for this. This will be very largely due to streptococcus or staphylococcus, these uh, bacteria which, which specialise in being passed on between people and being on the skin and then getting in when they get a chance. Now, within this, with, uh, the skin, of course, has to have certain breaks for particular reasons. And the two important ones that are built into the skin, because they're necessary for uh, temperature regulation uh, in particular, um, are hair uh, and sweat glands. And these allow bacteria sometimes to get into the skin through the holes which you have in either sweat pores uh, or in hairy parts of the body. And of course, this means uh, not all parts, you know, for example, the palms of the hand don't have hair at all, so that's not going to happen in those situations. 
And those can cause minor boils through to quite significant abscesses. So you get, you get this bacteria has managed to penetrate the infections and it's sitting in a relatively uh, um, protected site uh, within it. And the most common of these is this, uh, this bacteria, Staphylococcus aureus, I've talked about before, uh, a potentially uh, very dangerous uh, bacteria. Minor cases, of course, uh, resolve. All of us have had boils and, uh, and things of a similar sort. Uh, but in severe cases, uh, which are much rarer, uh, people can go on to get, uh, need a surgical release where they actually have a, someone actually removes the pus uh, and antibiotics. So the majority of cases self-resolve, but a few of them do go on to need minor surgery, relatively straightforward to do. Occasionally, however, Staphylococcus aureus can get, and other skin bacteria, but Staphylococcus is the most common uh, and the most important of these, uh, can get into the blood and cause significant infections. Uh, and in particular, Staphylococcus typically causes, uh, when it's off the skin, can cause abscesses. And it can cause these in multiple parts of the body, including the lung uh, and the brain. But probably the most, uh, most important severe one uh, that is reasonably common is heart valves, something called endocarditis. So this gets through the skin into the blood and then infects the heart valves. But it can also infect bones and joints. So bones, joints and heart valves are typical places this bacteria goes once it's got beyond the skin. And they will need significant long periods of antibiotics and in some cases surgery. A particular risk for getting these kinds of infections uh, is in fact hospital. And hospital is a very high risk environment for touch diseases. And there are several reasons for that. The first of which is in a sense a social reason. Touching strangers is part of the process of nursing and medicine uh, and other therapies. So there's a lot of touching of people who normally uh, would not do so. Secondly, um, intravenous lines, which are uh, part of treatment for many things, both medical and surgical in hospitals, are an easy way for a bacteria to get through the skin. We have actually made access from the outside of the skin into the body a lot easier, potentially, for bacteria. And it's one of the reasons people need to be very careful. They change drips and uh, look after them very carefully. And the more sick people are, the more lines they tend to have, and that would, the most sick people will be in things like intensive care, where you tend to have a combination of very often immunosuppressed, but certainly ill patients, so with less good immunity, with lots of lines going into them, and also an environment where lots of antibiotics are used. So you often get lots of multidrug resistant antibiotics. So hospital is actually a high risk place for getting a bacteria that's on the skin, transmitted by touch, into the body and causing uh, problems uh, later down the line and often sometimes, sometimes significant problems. So it is really important that hospital environments and healthcare environments take very seriously trying to reduce the risk, particularly of multidrug resistant, but all bacterial skin infections being passed on. And an example of this uh, is MRSA, uh, mycelin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It's a form of a Staphylococcus aureus. This is an example of a bacteria which can be passed on relatively straightforwardly, person to person by touch. It's the Staphylococcus like anything, anyone else, but uh, once it's drug resistant, if it then gets into someone, it's going to cause potential problems with treatment. And it's especially common in a hospital setting. The, tr the management of this is very straightforward. It's basic hygiene and washing hands and where appropriate, wearing gloves. And these are the key things which are necessary. And it, what you can see in this graph, the UK had quite a significant problem with MRSA and it hit the newspapers understandably because of the risk uh, that this posed. Uh, and by doing relatively straightforward basic hand hygiene measures in the main, uh, the rates of MRSA both in hospital, which drove this, and then in the community fell right down. And you can see that on the graphs on the right. So this is an example of the fact that really simple things can significantly reduce the risk of touch diseases, of which hand, hand washing uh, is the most important. 
Now, we've known this for some time, but this was not always, uh, this was not always accepted. Uh, and the early people who really pushed the need to reduce the risk of these touch diseases uh, were not appreciated by their professional colleagues. Uh, and I'll just give two examples. The first uh, was um, uh, Ignaz Simmelweis, a Hungarian physician. Uh, and um, he was working at a time when uh, purpural sepsis, that's bacterial infection soon after birth, was extremely common. And at that point, in some hospitals, 10% of women, roughly 10% of women, who went into the hospital to have a baby died of infection subsequently. So this is an astonishing mortality rate, and that's over and above those who died actually in childbirth itself. So childbirth was, to remind people, an extremely hazardous thing for women uh, in uh, the pre-antibiotic and pre-modern medicine uh, era. And he um, uh, thought, and correctly, that much of this was passed on by doctors who were not properly washing their hands, and in particular, not washing their hands between doing autopsies on people who'd recently died uh, and delivering a baby. Now, this is an extremely unpopular view that he put forward to people, uh, his professional colleagues. Um, he introduced chlorine hand washes, and the result, as you can see on the graph on the lower side, was when he introduced this, where people had to hand wash their hands before they actually delivered babies, the rates of purple sepsis dropped dramatically. Despite this, this was not popular, uh, and uh, he became more and more frustrated by this. I'm cutting a long story short. Uh, and um, he was not uh, in any way appreciated by his professional colleagues who had him committed to an asylum uh, by his medical peers, uh, where he was forcibly restrained, got an infection, and died two weeks later, age 47, as secondary sepsis. So uh, you know, the medical profession's resistance to change can sometimes uh, not help anybody. The second person um, who pushed this uh, was Lord Lister, um, Joseph Lister. And this was for surgery. Now, what had allowed surgery really to take off was anesthesia. Until you had anesthetics, it was impossible to do major surgery, really, for obvious reasons. Um, it had to be done, things that could only be done that could be done extremely quickly. But so the first big challenge was, the, uh, was, the an was anesthetics. But the second one was that many people who had surgery would then go on to die of sepsis shortly afterwards. And these, again, are passed on by touch. They were killed by uh, infections. Joseph Lister uh, introduced, following some research by Louis Pasteur, he thought, well, this might well be infection, and he introduced antisepsis. And this was to use things that killed bacteria and provided a barrier uh, which would much reduce the risk during surgery of passing on uh, bacteria, uh, which would go on to kill people if, if they were allowed to take root. And he uh, both had hands washed in it, he had the surgical instruments uh, washed in it, and he sprayed it on the uh, patient during, um, during the, uh, pr the operation. You can see this. Uh, this is a woodcut uh, showing this. Initially, Lister was mocked, but actually, over time, uh, it became really clear that this led to a significant reduction in wound sepsis and significant improvement in surgical outcomes. So here's a big advance, really, which actually allowed modern surgery uh, to develop. Modern surgery has now, however, moved further from antisepsis, where you use an antiseptic to reduce the risk that the bacteria will uh, cause problems, to asepsis, where the aim is to try and make sure the entire uh, area is as sterile as possible, uh, and that anything touching the wound or an exposed part of the body uh, is uh, sterile uh, in, uh, um, in some way. And this avoids contamination by touch uh, almost completely if it's done properly. So this has led to even better surgical outcomes. Touch is also, in addition to these infections I've talked about so far, which is really where touch is the principal means by which um, uh, infections are transmitted, touch may also be the main secondary route for infections transmitted by other routes, particularly the oral route and the respiratory route. Uh, and these tend to be diseases where people might cough, for example, or there might be diarrhea around um, or vomit, after norovirus, and people touch something and then touch their face, touch their particularly touch their mouth as a result. And they include COVID-19, 
flu, typhoid, norovirus, and uh, many other infections. So what, now the key thing here is hands. The way in which we all explore the environment around us and actually move things from another person, from another object to our face is almost invariably hands. You don't touch things with your face in this uh, under certain very limited set of circumstances. So if I can do a really clear commercial break here, hand washing with soap is one of the best things we can do both to reduce the risk of infections where touch is the principal route of transmission, like the ones I've been talking about now, and also the ones where it is an important secondary route of transmission, uh, for example, like flu. Uh, and this can help reduce the risk of infections to ourselves and to other people. So this is the reason why hand washing is so heavily, uh, heavily pushed by doctors, nurses, and others, because it really does make a, di and a difference in reducing the risk of multiple infections, not just one or two. So I'd now I'd like to move on to some really very severe diseases passed on person to person by touch, and I'm going to major in particular uh, on um, uh, Ebola, but uh, what I say, it's also true to a large degree of some other dangerous diseases, the viral hemorrhagic fevers, Ebola, Lassa fever, and Marburg uh, disease in particular, which have a lot, a lot in common. These are passed on di by direct contact with people, so touching them, or their bodily fluids. So if they have diarrhea or if they vomit, uh, or if you take blood, uh, you touching those can also be risky. Uh, and in all cases, this is about touching and then, uh, almost all cases, this is about touching uh, and then touching mucous membranes, but it also can be if people, for example, cut themselves whilst they're doing it, so direct uh, touch as well. Ebola and Marburg have both led to major outbreaks, and both of them in an outbreak environment, particularly where medical services are more limited, can have a mortality of over 65%, so uh, over two-thirds of people may uh, die. Lassa has a lower mortality, but it's still significant. And for example, in the UK, uh, we tragically had a death from Lassa in the last uh, few weeks. They get their name um, from the bleeding and internal hemorrhaging that can occur late in the disease. And people become more and more infectious the further on the disease goes. And that's quite important uh, in the management. And the biggest uh, epidemic to date uh, was the large West African Ebola epidemic of uh, 2014 to 2016, uh, which uh, rightly dominated the news for quite a long period in which the UK, uh, along with many other countries, assisted uh, colleagues from, uh, in, this, in particular, Sierra Leone and other West African countries, uh, because this needed an international effort to get on top of. Now, Ebola is an example of the fact that despite being relatively difficult to catch, so you've got to touch someone to catch this disease, um, uh, and uh, despite that, it spread really quite fast. And these are the maps of how quickly it spread from April to August 2014. So touch can still be quite an effective way to get uh, around a community. And we knew at a relatively early stage, uh, in particular from work by uh, doctors and scientists in uh, DRC, uh, formerly Zaire, who did, a, who did a lot of the science on this initially, that um, the R0, the force of transmission, which people have talked about a lot in the context of um, uh, COVID, was over one due to three different components, and all of them were driven by touch. The first was transmission in healthcare settings. Patients passing it on to doctors and nurses who would then pass it on to others. So that was a very important part of the transmission. And because people get more and more infectious, the sicker they get, the most infectious people were largely in hospital or at least being looked after by healthcare workers who might be traditional healthcare workers, but professional or uh, other healthcare workers. The second uh, route of transmission was doing funerals. In contrast to many other infections, People with Ebola are highly infectious after they died. And then the third one was transmission in the community, where it got from a funeral or got from a healthcare setting and then was transmitting in the general community. So those were the three different environments. Now, it's important to think about these because the, the way you're dealing with those is completely different. The impact on healthcare workers was very profound, and this is true for many touch diseases. 
Because people are infectious, they're in hospital, and they're touched by healthcare workers, healthcare workers are often the first people to start dying of it. It was true of SARS, it was true of Ebola, uh, for example, it's been true of Lassa and others. So they're very high, it's very high risk. And this just gives an example uh, from um, Nigeria, as it happens, an imported case uh, in this epidemic went into Nigeria. That's case one. Uh, all of the people um, who are in blue in the box below, all the people that this first case uh, infected were healthcare workers, and all of those with a red bar border around them tragically died. So this gives an impression of quite how dangerous this is, a touch disease can be to healthcare workers. And the, uh, in, in, uh, in that epidemic, we estimated that around 8 to 10% per person year of healthcare workers got infected, and of those, over 70% died. This was initially, until we worked out how to deal with that. So what this makes clear is that it's absolutely critical to do really rigorous uh, healthcare protection for everyone's benefit, but obviously in the first instance, healthcare workers and everyone they might subsequently infect. And this is about making sure that not, they cannot touch anything from the, either the body or um, any secretions. And this was highly effective. Once this took, it took hold and people did all the routines and had the kit, the rates of transmission went right, right down in healthcare settings. So that was the first one. That's a very classical bit of uh, public health um, in hospital settings. But we knew that that was not going to be enough. And there was an exponential curve of increasing rates. And what we knew is that the longer we delayed uh, intervening in, in wider ways, uh, the bigger this epidemic was going to get and the wider it was likely to spread. So it was absolutely critical to uh, get a move on uh, in helping to support um, colleagues in Sierra Leone. So the next um, component was reducing transmission from funerals and other peri-death rituals. It is absolutely normal in every society that people want to care for the sick, particularly their own family and friends, and that they want to celebrate their life and mourn after they die. So that is absolutely, every society does it in different ways, but that's, uh, that's, that's universal. And local burials here involved washing and touching the body. That's just, that was normal uh, procedure for, um, uh, in a dignified and respectful way, uh, uh, mourning and celebrating uh, the person. And we know perfectly well how to do a medically safe burial. It's a touch disease. It's about avoiding basically touching the uh, person who's recently died and what they did. The challenge, and this is a really key point here, was a social one, how to do it in a socially acceptable way so that a family and a community could mourn their family member or their friend or leader or a charismatic individual. Um, and this is where the social sciences became extremely important working with uh, local leaders to understand what was a respectful way of doing this that was still safe, and then moving to those kind of approaches, but not doing so in a way that actually interfered with the fact that people wanted rightly to uh, mark the passing of someone they uh, loved or cared about. And this was really important because several of the funerals, particularly of very high charisma people, including for example, uh, to high charisma people, uh, could lead to uh, over 100 people, for example, getting infected with Ebola with a very high mortality rate. So this was a very major part of the transmission rate. Uh, and sadly, many very, uh, very um, uh, important uh, uh, doctors died, uh, including Dr. Uma Khan, who's one of the Sierra Leonean leaders uh, in this area, along with many others. And of course, we wanted, uh, people wanted rightly to give proper respect, but to do so in a safe way. And then the third component was increasing social distancing in the community. It's relatively difficult to catch in the community, but the key was to make it less so. So simple things like how could you do a respectful greeting that didn't involve a handshake, which is obviously at high risk in this environment. And this is a demonstration of religious leaders from different faiths demonstrating respectful greetings that don't actually require physical touch. But again, the key is to make it acceptable socially. And many of the things we had to do, of course, had serious downsides, closing schools, roads, markets, what in, in recent terms we would have termed here uh, lockdown was necessary to get on, on, on top of this. And alongside that was trying to make sure that the people who had symptoms of Ebola, which were very similar to lots of other things, isolated very early on. And then later in the disease, when we had rapid diagnostic tests, that we could find all their contacts, 
and isolate them as well. And that way, we actually were able to get on top of, when I say we, I mean the general medical community, um, led by uh, Sierra Leonean doctors and Sierra Leonean government, uh, able to get on top of this uh, by um, uh, reducing, little by little, the number of people that someone came in contact with physically, and therefore the number they passed it on to. Because if you can reduce it down from a situation where every person was infecting more than one person to a situation where every person is infecting less than one person, then the disease goes away. But we were then able uh, to move over time from a purely social model of public health, which is all about isolating people, to a much more medical model uh, as we developed new scientific tools. And uh, as with COVID, the most important of these was a vaccine or vaccines. So although the, this particular outbreak was ended almost entirely using social public health, distancing, straightforward uh, ways of preventing touch uh, between infected and uninfected people, initially including the whole, whole of society, and then as we got more testing, uh, able to concentrate on those who had actually got infection, uh, once we got uh, later in the uh, epidemic, uh, two, um, initially two, and then subsequently more, Ebola vaccines were developed, over 80% effective, and we can move over to a situation where they can do most of the work. So, so rather than uh, actually having a situation where it's all done socially, we move increasingly over to a situation where it's all done medically with vaccines and drugs, which is much less socially disruptive, again, as we've seen uh, with COVID. Uh, we weren't able to vaccinate the whole population. There weren't the vaccines available to do that. Uh, and so the method that was used, which was effective in the, the environment of this particular touch disease, would work less well uh, in something like COVID, was something called ring vaccination. You find the person is infected, and then you vaccinate all the people who they've come into contact with, and indeed, uh, ideally, all the people that they've come into contact with, and therefore you make sure that there's a ring around them that isn't a physical barrier, but is one where actually those people are immune and therefore the disease doesn't pass out from around this. This is something that was developed originally for eliminating and then eradicating smallpox. So those are some very serious diseases um, passed on human to human, although the initial uh, case for Ebola was probably a child touching a bat. So it was actually originally jumping species. And now I'd just like to talk briefly about some infections inquired by humans touching animals. There are quite a lot of these, uh, and just as you can catch infections from humans by touching them, you can catch infections from animals by touching them. Uh, some common ones uh, include something, something called ORF, something you can catch, for example, by touching goats. Uh, it's not dangerous, but uh, can be unsightly, as you can see uh, on this finger on the top left. Uh, anthrax of the skin, which is one of the less dangerous forms of anthrax, but you also can catch by touching animals or animal hides. Uh, and an important one historically for several reasons was cowpox. You get this from, uh, milkmaids got this from milking cows uh, that were infected on their hands. Uh, and this is important both because it was an important disease uh, for quite a long time, uh, but also because it was the origin of vaccination. So taking the sample of cowpox from a milkmaid um, uh, a lady called Sarah uh, Nilms, um, and, uh, trans and transferring that onto a child protected them from smallpox, which is a much more dangerous disease, and that was the initial uh, step along vaccination done by Edward Jenner. But we can also um, uh, pass on really fairly straightforward bacteria, so you can actually pass on, for example, multidrug-resistant bacteria to uh, companion animals and pets uh, by touching them uh, and potentially also vice versa. So touching, you can actually pass on things uh, between species relatively straightforwardly. Some human parasites and other infections have, however, evolved to specialise in transmission indirectly from touching soil, sand, or mud, or swimming in fresh water. And very many of the places you can actually catch these things are extremely beautiful to look at and enjoyable uh, to spend time on, beaches, uh, and swimming in, fre in, in freshwater lakes, for example, uh, are two of the ways uh, this can happen. Start off with some uh, worms, uh, which have, used, learned, have evolved 
to uh, use soil to transmit by touch. And the two most important uh, ones of hum human ones are hookworms uh, and a, uh, an infection called strongyloides. But they're passed on in broadly the same way. And uh, hookworm on the right, show the life cycle. It's really quite a complicated life cycle. So it's evolved to do this uh, because this is an effective way of passing on. Uh, people excrete, um, who are infected excrete eggs of the hookworm in their feces. And if that gets into the soil, then uh, the, um, uh, the larvae come out uh, in the soil or sand. And then if someone walks over it or lies on it or touches the sand or soil, that gets through the skin. So it's, it's evolved to get through the skin. It then goes up through the lungs. It's a very complicated uh, life cycle. And back to, the, back to the gut, at which point it starts to excrete eggs and the cycle repeats. So this is a parasite that's evolved incredibly effectively to use the fact that we uh, defecate outside and then touch sand or soil to achieve, use touch to be transmitted. And strongyloides uh, is relatively similar. It's a slightly, slightly more dangerous, actually, disease. Although hookworm in a heavy infection can cause anemia and various other problems. There are also, and this people who've lain on beaches may well be aware of this, dog and cat hookworms can do some of this. They can actually penetrate the skin, but then they essentially get lost. But they cause a big inflammatory response. And you get what you see here, uh, which is something called cutaneous larva migraine. So you lie, you're lying on the beach one day, and then uh, a few days later, or some time later, uh, you get this itching. And you can sometimes see these worms moving very slowly. You can't actually see them racing. Very slowly, day to day, they move as they move through your skin. Eventually, they'll die. They can't go anywhere because they're not designed for humans. But this is an example where the parasite has kind of got halfway there. Then um, uh, there are other uh, infections um, which uh, actually also use um, sand or soil. These, the, here's, here's one example, uh, jigger fleas. Got a num number of other names, but uh, that's the normal colloquial one. Uh, eggs are hatched in the sand. Um, they're fleas. They can move around, jump in some cases. Uh, they get into the skin. They penetrate the skin. The female penetrates the skin, then swells up. Uh, the male mates with the um, female who's in, in the right place, and then she has eggs, and they break out, uh, and the cycle continues. And they can really be quite painful for people, and you can see this person. You can actually pull, you can actually cut them, well, uh, push them out, um, uh, but uh, they can be uh, quite unpleasant if you've got a lot of them, and if they're in the wrong place, can be quite, uh, quite painful to have. Uh, and there are other parasites that are specialised in slightly different methods with touch. For example, uh, tumbu flies are something which lays eggs on, on wet clothing, and if you then wear that clothing, they put a little, the, 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 uh, the maggots actually penetrate your skin and they develop in your skin. So there are a variety of parasites that have actually specialized uh, in using your skin as the place that they, uh, they develop at certain parts of their life cycle. So those are ones from land or objects. Um, then there are some parasites which have evolved to penetrate the skin from fresh water. And the most important of these is schistosomiasis. It has a very complicated life cycle, but again, the simple version is that people either pee, it out, pee out eggs or it comes out in their stool, depends on which type of schistosomiasis it is. That gets into fresh water, the eggs hatch, and they get some little myricidia, uh, and these little parasites swim and penetrate your skin, get into the body, into the bit of the body they live in. Different ones live in different parts of the body. Uh, girl meets boy, mate, produce eggs, and the cycle repeats. So these ones have developed a way of getting through the skin very, very specifically. And they do this via um, some uh, snails where they have to actually use them. On the left are the three different snails which go with three different forms of schistosomiasis in different parts of the world. So this, is a, this particular method is used by different forms of schistosomiasis in different parts of the world. Other animals uh, also have different sorts of schistosomiasis, but these are, these are ones that affect humans. So those are parasites. There are also fungal infections which you get from touching soil or plants. Unlike the parasites I've just talked about, this is probably, in a sense, incidental. It's not a key part of their life cycle, but they can still cause very significant problems. Fungal diseases are particularly dangerous in people who are immunosuppressed. Severe AIDS have got other problems, but they can affect people um, who've actually uh, got normal uh, immunity. Which fungus we're talking about that you can catch by 
contact, particularly with soil or vegetable matter, uh, depends on where in the world you are. So, for example, sporotrichosis uh, is known as rose gardener's disease, quite uh, well known in parts of the USA. Uh, Madeira foot, which uh, is demonstrated uh, in this photograph here, really quite dangerous uh, um, fungal infection uh, you can get in parts of Africa, Asia, or Latin America. So the fungus, which fungus you get depends where in the world you are, but what's common to them uh, is touching. And the foot ones, the best uh, way probably to prevent them uh, is wearing shoes. Finally, I'd like to just talk about two very severe diseases where the infection is only passed on when there is a puncture to the skin and it's achieved by different routes. The first uh, is tetanus. And this follows a wound or a prick uh, and is caused by a nerve toxin which causes very severe spasms, uh, illustrated here in a soldier with tetanus um, uh, in uh, the previous era. It's an extraordinarily distressing disease to have uh, and a, with a high mortality, uh, even with uh, fairly good treatment. Um, Historically, what happens is it lives in soil or animal dung, it's its principal root, uh, and so, so it's dirty wounds which tend to uh, cause this, but you may not actually see the dirt, but they've got soil or dung usually on them. Uh, and classically, the kind of places you tend, people tend to get them, three different environments, agriculture, where people are uh, constantly among soil and can take cuts and nicks and not really notice them particularly. Uh, war, classical place to get tetanus. Uh, in, the, uh, in the previous era, and childbirth in non-sterile settings and unclean surgery. These are all routes by which tetanus can get in. It forms a little small abscess, often not noticed, not a very, it's not really a particularly big deal, but it produces an incredibly potent toxin, and that's the dangerous part. So the tetanus toxin, once it's circulating in the, the blood, often tiny amounts, uh, gets into the muscle, and then moves up the motor nerves up to the central spinal uh, column. And at that point, it binds irreversibly to the bit of the system that stops you spasming. So your whole body is in permanent situation where the movement you make, you can just stop it exactly where you want because it's always in balance. And what tetanus does is it turns off the thing which allows you to stop it at the particular point and people go into uncontrollable spasms. Uh, these uh, are very painful and can compromise people's breathing very badly, uh, and uh, the mortality can be extremely high. Uh, in severe cases um, where treatment's not available, up to 80% in adults and up to 100% in neonates who catch this. So it's a very dangerous uh, infection. Neonatal tetanus in particular has an extremely high mortality. And in, in rural communities without expert, expert midwifery, uh, and they, this led to a high proportion of neonates uh, dying. Up to 50% had been recorded and higher than that in some places, including photograph of the top, top right here, St Kilda, the most uh, remote part of the British Isles, where the majority of children at various points in history would die of tetanus after childbirth because of uh, getting probably soil and dung into uh, wounds as, or, or um, the care of the umbilical stump. So once people have got, once neonates have got tetanus, uh, mortality is essentially 100%. It was very common in rural UK and USA as well as the rest of the world uh, prior to vaccination. But the two things that have transformed this are modern midwifery and clean birthing practice and tetanus vaccination. And as vaccination of women who are pregnant or, or are likely to become pregnant has expanded, neonatal tetanus has essentially gone away. So it's, it's, it's vaccination of mum either prior to or during pregnancy, uh, which has got rid of this really serious uh, problem for newborns. So the vaccine for tetanus has transformed the risk. The tetanus uh, vaccine is um, to the toxin, it's not to the infection, you still get the infection. Uh, and uh, it um, means that you don't then get uh, any form of um, uh, likely uh, tetanus, tetanus spasming. But because it's, against the, it's not against the infection, it's against the um, uh, toxin, if you're vaccinated, that protects you, but it doesn't, in, it doesn't actually protect anyone else. This is an infection from the soil, uh, and there's no form uh, of herd effect. And to be clear, herd effect only really, in my view, refers to a situation in this, like this where there's widespread vaccination. So it is very important to vaccinate mothers to protect their newborns, 
as well as doing proper uh, birthing practice. Um, and tetanus is now given uh, to uh, children and at various other points, usually with two other very serious infections, uh, diphtheria and pertussis, but those uh, are not uh, touch diseases. The final infection that I'd like to talk about um, uh, are, are, is rabies. And this does, again, this is a touch disease, but it has to get through the skin, and it does this by the bite of an animal. Uh, up to 90%, 99% of human cases are from dog bites, and it's still a very serious problem. Rabies, once someone has got rabies, the disease, so if they're not vaccinated, is 100% fatal, and it is an extraordinarily unpleasant way to die. It's, uh, of all the ways I've seen to die of an infection, it is the worst. People die in terror, usually within uh, 10 days. Uh, and the way that uh, rabies achieves this is that the animals which have it uh, um, are extraordinarily irritable and aggressive. They salivate very heavily. They find it very difficult to swallow, and they snap at anything. So a dog which has got rabies, a rabid dog, will basically bite anything around it. This, this would include dogs, uh, which normally would be very placid. So the infection, as part of the way, it, the way, essentially the way it transmits, is to get the dog to puncture the skin while salivating, and the saliva then that's, that's injected into the skin by touch uh, will then cause rabies uh, in the victim. Rabies, fortunately, is becoming rarer, but it is still a significant part of the problem in many parts of the world. Uh, the, the, key, the key thing with this, three things with this, three ways we use vaccination. The first, and probably the most important, actually, is vaccinating uh, dogs and other domestic animals, but particularly dogs. The second is to uh, vaccinate um, wild animals, which might pass on rabies, such as foxes, and this has been done by baiting uh, put, putting a uh, vaccine on bait, like chicken heads, spreading them around, and then the, uh, the wild animals get vaccinated uh, whilst they munch their chicken bones. Uh, and the third uh, is in humans. You can both get vaccine prophylaxis, particularly if you're going to a place a long way from uh, medical help or where you're dealing with many animals, uh, and post-vaccination, if you get someone fast enough, the vaccine is effective in the first few days and will prevent it developing. So the vaccine has been transformational and rabies is going down, but it is still a very significant problem. And this really just demonstrates, once you vaccinate dogs, then the rate of rabies in dogs goes down, and then the rate of rabies in humans goes down as a secondary result of that. So the key is actually, uh, in this case, vaccinating the animal. So in summary, several ways in which infections are passed on principally by touch. Skin skin infections, such as viral warts and scabies, several bacterial skin infections, some of which can then, if they get into the body, can be really quite significant, particularly Staphylococcus aureus. Hospital acquired infections is a high risk environment if people are not obsessional uh, with their hand hygiene. It's also a secondary route for respiratory and oral infections. Uh, and then finally, in terms of human-to-human -human, uh, direct contact, uh, you have these very severe diseases such as La uh, Ebola or Lassa, uh, which are also passed on by touch. And with all of these, social things which avoid touching multiple strangers and hand washing are part of the way that we reduce the risk uh, of transmission in the community. And then you get uh, infections from touching animals, uh, and then infections from a particular quite specialized often infections from touching soil, sand, or fresh water. And these are used by several parasites, fungi and uh, bacteria. And finally, there are some infections which in a sense are specialized at puncturing the skin uh, and for their transmission, uh, including tetanus and rabies. So touch is a very important route of transmission. And a lot of the ways you need to think about how you reduce the, this is as much in the social sphere and using the social sciences as it is in the biological ones. But vaccines have certainly transformed the risk of some of the most dangerous touch diseases, including rabies, tetanus, and Ebola. Thank you very much.